Somebody up there named Mark broke the countdown timer. So we're going to go ahead and start right now, okay? The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 2, 17. Can't remember what the one is for next month, but we'll worry about that next month. Who wants to go first, kids? AJ does. The, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. 1 John 2.17. The world desires pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever, the will, who, whoever is the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Of course, yes, we do. First John 2, 17. Me, me and Paul. Me and Paul. What is it? You know it. <laughs> the world, it's the desires make pass away, but whoever, but whoever not the will of God lives forever. First John 2, 17. The world and its desire passed away, but whoever, whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Very good. See the world. The world. And its desires. The world. They pass away. They pass away. Pass away. But whoever, but whoever does the world of God. Lives forever. Together? Singular. Together? No. <laughs> the world is the science. Pass away. But whoever does the will of God, God live forever. Good job, Wendy. You got me all messed up. Are you ready? You want to do it? You want me to move on to Jackson? Watch Jackson do it. The world and his desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. First John 2.17. The world and its desires passed away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Good job. Together? 
The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. Um, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Good job, kids. All together now. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 2.17. Good job. Thanks, Jeremy. Good morning and happy Easter to everybody. Good to see everybody here this morning. Um, here to Patterson Road Church of Christ. Uh, for announcements this morning, I'd like to open uh, up a couple of uh quick things to say that I was told I look like an Easter egg this morning from from Matt. Yeah, I got, Matt and Mike got together, but I got news for you guys. Scott Ferguson and I got together, and we talked to each other about what to wear today. So, you know, so there. Yeah. Way to go, Scott. Yep. All right. So uh, start off with announcements this morning. Uh, if you could text Ann Clayton if you could provide help for the CMU student supper on April 21st, uh, just text her. Uh, right now she's traveling. She's headed to Nashville, according to what Doug said. Uh, and so, but send her a text if you're able to assist in that CMU meal um, that's coming up on April 21st. And also an update on Farrell, who uh, fell and broke her pelvis uh, in three places, as Sandy clarified this morning. Uh, she is at rehab right now and just continued prayers for her uh her recovery is going to be slow she's impatient with it as he said but uh it's going to be slow but we're looking forward to her uh, expedient return also an update on carl antwine is back in the hospital with complications from his uh pancreatitis and i've got a side note here it says brothers and sisters carl and i thank you for all of the cards and many of you who have sent the kind words and prayers that have been offered. Carl is very ill, but thankfully there are a few options to help him in recovery from this pancreatitis um, and deal with the large pseudocyst that he has. May God bless you all <clears throat> for your concern and for your love. Jan Antoine. And then... Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad to see this off my list, but you guys enjoyed it yesterday because I could never get the announcement right. But it says, thank you to all those who helped at the pancake breakfast in Easter egg hunt yesterday. It was a wonderful time for family and fellowship. Um, so, yeah, good good to see. <laughs> I, I could never get the announcement right. So uh, all the way to the point where D Doug had to take the airplane over. So <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> Please check the bulletin for more announcements. And then uh, on a final note, um, this baptistry back here is, uh, is useful in many, many, many venues um, uh, for to say that uh, for salvation. What we don't want is to have any young children wander into the baptistry when it is unoccupied or people are not accompaniment here during the week. So if you by chance see the baptistry unlocked there are an upper lock and i believe as doug described a lower lock to make sure that the baptistry is secure before you leave the building so we don't have any young people wander up there and accidentally end up in the baptistry but we wouldn't want that so uh that said that concludes the announcements and if you would go with me to prayer as we go to our father heavenly father grateful are we for the day um this day we we celebrate um lord the world celebrates an empty tomb. We celebrate, Lord, an empty tomb and the opportunity for salvation. We celebrate your love for us through um, that empty tomb. Lord, we rejoice that Jesus uh, ascended for um, the forgiveness of our sins and to prepare a place for us. We ask humbly, Lord, as we go to our Father, that you'll bless this morning's worship with wisdom in the spirit of truth and understanding and discernment of your word. We're grateful for all those here, for your presence, most importantly. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen.
Let's stand and sing together. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God up.
God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior Because I know he owns the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Remember that fact together as we partake of communion after this song. If you haven't gathered those emblems, the cup, and the bread, they're around the tables on the outside of the, of the room. So as we're singing this next song, grab one of those and bring it back to your seat. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is 
is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no sea of man, can ever pluck thee from his hand, till he returns or calls me Nothing makes me happier than when I get to walk up here to do something to serve the church and I get to see my brothers and sisters. Man, it's amazing. Full house. It's like Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and I love you all. The tomb is empty. I told Charlie I would say that. The tomb is empty. And that's the greatest news we could be given. As we gather today on this blessed Easter, we're reminded of the incredible sacrifice and triumphant resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Easter is a time of renewal, a celebration of life triumphing over death, and a poignant reminder of God's limitless love for us. As we partake in communion today, let us reflect on the significance of the bread and the cup. The bread which represents Jesus' body, broken for us, reminds us of his enduring love and the sacrifice he willingly endured. In these moments, let's draw near to the heart of Easter. It's not just about the pain and the sacrifice, but also about the joyous resurrection that followed. Jesus' victory over death offers us hope, a promise that no matter 
the darkness and trials we face, God's light and love will prevail. If you'll please pray with me. Heavenly Father, oh my goodness, thank you for today. Thank you for everyone who's here, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, thank you for the sacrifices. Thank you for everything you have given us. Thank you for your son. And thank you for the resurrection. Because in that act, you showed us that we could be risen from the dead. Those of us who are dead in sin can may be made alive again in your perfect sacrifice. Lord, as we come to you today, please bless us with your grace and mercy and help us to seek you in the things that we do. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The cup that is symbolic of his blood shed on the cross seals a new covenant, a promise of redemption and eternal life for all who believe. As we share in this communion, let us remember the essence of Easter, the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, a testament to God's power to bring life where there was death, to bring hope where there was despair. Let this communion be a time of deep gratitude for the ultimate sacrifice made for us, and let it also be a celebration of the new life we've been given through Jesus's Christ, Jesus Christ's resurrection. May the love we share today reflect the love that was so powerfully demonstrated for us on this day in Easter. Please pray with me. O oh, mighty Lord, O oh, sovereign God, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Lord, the power to know that you can undo everything we do that does not abide or edify your way. And that for you, it's, it's a blessing you freely give us. All we have to do is come to you. Confess, repent, and believe. Lord, thank you for today. May you be edified in everything that comes forward. And may we walk in a way that shows people your love in our walk. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what your You 
As we're here today to talk about the greatest sacrifice and the greatest, greatest blessing that we could all be given, I just ask this of you today. We have boxes at the edge of the auditorium and in the back. If you're compelled to give, give. If it's from your heart, give. But I ask more that you take the blessings that you have been given to bless the people around you the way that you have been blessed by Christ. Please join us with me as we pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, may the blessings that are given today be used in a way that you see fit. May we be given wisdom. May we be given fortitude. May we be given opportunity to fulfill your works in this world through the through the sacrifice and blessings that have been given to the people in this room. May we walk forward in a way that shows people your mercy, grace, and love and use every gift you have given us to do so. In your son's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. All this pain, I wonder if I'll ever find my way. I wonder if my life could really change at all. All this could all that is lost. things 
out of us. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of Stop by the bathroom on your way up to room 212. You're gonna have a great lesson up there today, I'm sure, as are we in here. Before Doug brings us that message, we're gonna sing one more song. If it's comfortable for you, let's stand and, and praise together this one more song before Doug comes up. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks.
Amen. Thank you, church, for being here. I um, am amazed of the timing of, of God in all aspects. And so I am thankful that some of you are here who might not have been here for a while. And, and I'm thankful for family. I'm thankful for your presence in the family of God. And I'm thankful if you are here just seeking, trying to seek anew even, where this whole thing about resurrection fits into your life. Because we all need a prompt once in a while, do we not? We all need a nudge in the right direction. And so when I see you, I see people I know. I see people, I, a few that I don't know. But when I look in your faces, I see Jesus Christ. I see a Savior who gave up everything he had to come and to die for every face in this crowd. And I see love in your faces. I see goodness. I see heartbreak. I see struggle. I see pain. And yet because of the resurrection in your faces, I see hope. And a hope that is true. And a hope that allows us to live life as God intended. So thankful to be back with you this week. I appreciate Jim Mueller filling in for me last week. Um, as Ann and I <clears throat> both drove to the Little Rock Airport Thursday, I got an airplane and came back to Grand Junction. She got on an airplane and went to Knoxville. She's there visiting her sisters uh, for about uh, three, four more days. She'll be back Friday, Lord willing. But uh, it's always good to get away, always good to be back and to uh, try to filter through thousands of emails and voicemails and so forth. But um, I want to thank you for being here this morning. And so the question of the sermon this morning is who will move the stone or who will roll away the stone? That's an actual quote from Scripture that we're going to read in just a moment. And you know what that's talking about. I'm going to elaborate a little bit about that, but, but I want you to make that question personal right now. I want you to think about why you're here, what brought you to this place at 10.15 on a Sunday morning, March 31st, 2024. Whatever brought you here, I'm glad you're here. But what I want you to think about is the stone, that heavy object, that immovable object in your life that you're wondering how you're going to get rid of. Who will move that stone for you? That's what the resurrection is about. So let's read a little bit. Mark chapter 16. Jesus had been buried by Joseph of Arimathea in his tomb that he loaned. Nicodemus was a part of that burial party. The tomb was sealed. Sealed literally by a very heavy stone and sealed by Roman guards who guarded it and by the stamp of Rome that said, by threat of death, this, this tomb will be opened. So on a Sunday morning, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other. <laughs> I could see them looking at each other, saying, how are we going to get in when we get there? Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They weren't physically able to do that. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. That seal of Rome had been broken. And you know by other accounts that the guards, <laughs> they feared for their lives. Verse 5, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. They were fearful. 
Don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? I can see this angelic creature pointing this wing over here. (laughs) See the place where they laid him? He's not there. But now you go and you tell his disciples and you tell Peter that he's gone on ahead of you unto Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ remains the most powerful and consequential event in all of history. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. It changes the past, your past, my past, the past all the way back until time began. It changes the past, it changes our present, who we are today, and it changes the future. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, that great resurrection chapter. If there is no resurrection of the dead, there were people in the church who were saying, the resurrection's already passed, it's not going to happen, so what are we doing here? Paul says, whoa, wait a minute. If there is no resurrection of the dead, and you might be thinking there, well, what is he talking about? He's talking about someday where you and I go in the grave, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of dead, then not even Christ has been raised. The two go together. If you are denying that there is a resurrection down the road, you're denying that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be liars, false witnesses about God. For we have testified, taught, preached about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain. It's worthless. So what are you doing here? Then those also who have fallen asleep, those loved ones who have died, in Christ, if there is no resurrection, they're done. End of story. If only for this life, there's a lot of people just banking on just this life, amen? If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are people most to be pitied. It all points to the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus in the past and the resurrection of us in the future. I hope you're not one of those people who are to be pitied because you don't believe in the resurrection to come nor the resurrection that has already happened. There's various biblical images of Jesus. We read about them in Scripture, the suffering servant, and they come into sharp focus, all culminating in the death, burial, and resurrection. And so we're just going to look at a few of those this morning together, and I think they'll, they'll kind of complete this story that we're talking about, and you'll see how we summarize that. The first image that we see in this death, burial, resurrection, eternal trifecta, is humility. We see Jesus' humility manifested. Paul writes about it in Philippians 2. And he says, the best way to live, the best way for a church to interact with one another, the best way for families to have unity, the best way for God's people to get along is this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to or grasped, but he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What does that mean? That means Jesus abandoned his place in heaven. He abandoned his glory with the Father, and love does what nothing else will. What else could have moved Jesus Christ out of heaven to earth to suffer and die but love? Love's the premise of humility that will leave heaven. 
Love is the premise of humility that takes on shame and ridicule and to suffer and to die for things he never did. Humility is the fragrance of approachability. Some people are hard to approach, aren't they? You say, ah, they're kind of intimidating. I don't know if I can talk to that person. They're kind of aloof. They might be condescending. But when you run across a person who is humble, it just says, welcome. They're approachable. And Jesus was approachable. The sweet scent of empathy was seen in his humility and his compassion and his kindness. He who was everything made himself nothing. So in Jesus Christ's resurrected body, we even see a hint of that approachableness, that, that he was touchable. Remember doubting Thomas? He said, I, I'm not going to believe unless I see this and touch this firsthand. Jesus said, touch me. Touch the scars. Touch my side. Touch my hands. We have no pre-resurrection account of Jesus inviting someone to touch him. Yet Jesus invites Thomas to touch his glorified body. And that same invitation is for us today, if we will but reach out and touch him. Jesus is approachable. And so may we reflect Jesus' humility as we daily crucify ourselves, daily crucify our pride, our ego, for the benefit of others. That's not easy to do. Jesus showed us how hard it was. But humility is seen in what Jesus did for us. And then we see submission and surrender. Wow, there's no mystery to that behind the resurrection, behind the death, behind the scorn, behind the, 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 the whipping and the beatings that Jesus took. Hebrews 5, 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience. How? He had to suffer. And having been made perfect, complete, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Though he was a son, that's a phrase that means something. That's a phrase that implies royalty. It's a phrase that implies privilege. In Jesus' culture, if you were the child of power or wealth, you didn't have to do the chores. You didn't have to suffer. You didn't have to do all those other things because you were born into power, born into wealth, born into royalty. And if you were, your father commanded servants. He commanded slaves to do the work. He commanded those others to obey, to suffer, and to endure hardship. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords surrendered all that status, and he became a slave. He became a servant, and he faithfully obeyed and suffered for us. You remember those words in the garden? Jesus was in agony. He wanted a different way. He knew not only that he was going to have to endure the pain of the cross, but he was going to have to endure all the sins that mankind have ever committed until, from Adam and Eve all the way until the end of, the time, end of time. All those sins he would bear on the cross. Can you imagine that? It's hard to bear our own sins. But he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. This is the voice of complete submission. And so in the resurrected Christ, we see the image of love, motivated obedience that will stop at nothing to pay the very costly price for our sin. And then we see joy. How in the world do you see joy in the midst of death, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a tomb? Jesus teaches us how, because he sees that in us. He says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. There's another question there, isn't there? Remember the first question? Who's going to roll away the stone in your life? Where are your eyes fixed in your life right now? Are they fixed on Jesus? Or are they fixed on all the other things that the world keeps inundating our minds and our hearts with? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who writes our story. He's the author and perfecter, the completer of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy set before Jesus compelled him to endure the pain. I mean, you as a parent, those of you who are parents or even grandparents, know that you will suffer any type of pain to spare your child, to save your child, to help your child so they would not have to suffer. How many of us have had sick kids or, or kids in an accident or kids in the hospital and we did not say, Lord, help me take their place. I would give anything if I could be in that hospital bed in their place. This is what Jesus is going through. This agony, this pain, this shame, the burden of the world's sin, but it was motivated by joy. This joy was the realization that not only was his unimaginable suffering about to end, he knew he'd been through a lot and he was about to endure this painful death. But he also saw all of creation. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he saw every single soul conceived in the womb. And he knew that what he was going through, his death, could bring an opportunity to save every single person. I believe he even saw those yet unborn I believe he saw every person who would ever live. He saw your face. He saw my face. He saw the face of your family and your parents. And he's on that cross, and that was the joy, your face, that caused him to stay there, that kept him from calling 10,000 angels, that kept him from saying, God, Father, this is too much. I cannot endure this. I will not endure it. The joy set before him was your salvation. And so he endured that suffering for us. So while hanging on that cross, he saw us. And he knew the joy of rescuing and redeeming us from our sins. He knew the joy and hope of the new heavens and the new earth that would come after that future resurrection. And we are that joy set before him. And then we see this disturbing, dark peace of Jesus' time on the cross. Matthew chapter 27, Jesus had been through so much. And he now is feeling the weight of all the world's sin. And the text says about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my father, my dad, why have you abandoned? Why have you forsaken me? Can you feel the emotion in that? Can you feel the pain? Can you feel the sense of loneliness as he hung on that cross? As Jesus hung in agony, he took his last breath. He committed his spirit to the Father, and he said, it is finished. It is finished. What I don't want us to bypass is this. If even the Son of God can feel alone, can feel forsaken because of very, very difficult, painful times, then it's okay for us to feel that too. It doesn't mean God has abandoned us. It doesn't mean God is not present. It just means that God knows how we feel in the throes of pain but he will never, ever leave his children. Jesus said it's finished, and those words changed the tide of human history forever. Evil at the cross had its high water mark. That's as close as evil and darkness would ever get. It's as close as they would get to overcoming God's goodness. Victory was assured with the empty tomb. And so at this point, as Jesus is on the cross, he utters the last words of his physical life, and he breathes his last. Everyone, the Pharisees who orchestrated his crucifixion, the Romans who were the vessels about through which that came, the disciples who were just in shock and confusion, they all thought this was the end of Jesus of Nazareth. Even Satan thought he had won. But just when you think it's over, victory is snatched from the jaws of defeat and darkness. 
When Jesus said, it is finished, he was not conceding defeat. We need to know that. Sometimes we think, okay, I give up. It was not finished as in, I'm finished, Father. I'm done. I cannot do this. It was finished as in, we did it. It's complete. It's finally perfected and fulfilled, and I will rise, and the world will be redeemed, and death is finished forever, conquered by eternal life. That's what those words mean. It is finished for us because of the victory that Jesus gave us. And then we see that stone. We're kind of back to the verse that we started out with, Mark 16, 1 through 3. These three women, they trudged with heavy hearts towards the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus on a Sunday morning. And being perceptive and being practical, as women are, they turned to each other and said, who will roll away the stone from the entrance? How are we going to get inside to see our crucified Lord? Until that very moment, they had not realized this truth. And I want you to make the spiritual connection to yourself. Until that very moment they had not realized without intervention, they could, not, they could go no further than the sealed grave. They couldn't get past that stone. They couldn't get past that rock. They couldn't get past that thing that kept them from the presence of Jesus without divine help. Isn't that the story of resurrection? Our sin creates a stone barrier between us and God, and we cannot get close to Jesus without divine intervention, without godly, heavenly help, without Emmanuel, God, with us, without a Savior on the cross who died for us, without the stone of our sin being removed for us by God. We are stuck at death forever. But praise be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the image of the moved tombstone, that tombstone that was sealed by the power of Rome, we see the impossible made possible. We see our sins forgiven. We see our lives transformed. We see death defeated and we see the promise of living forever in immortal, glorified bodies. There's something that's unique about the moving of this stone that we often kind of take for granted or just assume. God did not move the stone so Jesus could get out. He didn't. He rolled away the stone so that those women and you and I could get into the presence of God. He moved the stone for us so that all could see it was empty, so that we could all enter into that grave and arise from it to walk in newness of life. The stone was rolled away so that we could have direct access to the eternal blessings of the resurrection. You know, I don't know for, for how many years I thought, wow, God, I'm glad you moved that stone out of the way so Jesus could get out. <laughs> no. Jesus walked through walls. He didn't need that stone removed. It was for us. It's always for us because of the good God we serve. And so as we see the empty tomb, we, by faith, our sermon series on by faith, we, by faith, do not live in despair. I know it's hard sometimes, but we, because of the resurrection, do not live in despair. We, by faith, live in hope. We don't live in defiance anymore or rebellion, but we live in surrender. We live in obedience. We don't live in pride and ego and selfishness anymore, but we, like Jesus, live in humility. We don't live in drudgery, but we live like Jesus in joy. We don't live in fear of being forsaken, but with the assurance of God's faithfulness who will always be there in our darkest moments, even when it doesn't feel like it. The stone has been forever moved, and you and I are invited to draw close and to share in the gift of our resurrected Savior. As we close, I want you to think about this passage that Paul writes in Romans 8. 
the Spirit of God, the power of God, the force of the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, we just talked about that, that power, that miracle. What does it take to raise a person from the dead? That power, that same power, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. If you have been born again, you have received the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well in you today. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he's going to give life to your mortal, your fallible, your decaying body by the same Spirit living within you. There's a double promise there that the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us right now. He's in us right now, and that's why you can have joy in the midst of suffering. And that's why you can understand the bigger picture in light of the small, painful picture right now. Because of the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And when you don't know how to pray, you don't know what to pray, the Bible says the Spirit that is in you tells the Father exactly what's on your heart, exactly what's on your mind, exactly the thing that you can't come up with words. You just sit and groan and the Spirit says, Father, here's what Doug is saying. Here's what he needs. That same power is in you because of the resurrection. It's because of the resurrection. And so on resurrection day, the promise of redemption, the promise of immortality one day is guaranteed. If you are in Christ and you have shared in that resurrection and you believe and trust and hope in that resurrection, you're going to get a brand new body. It's going to be a body that is immortal, that will not be subject to decay, and we are going to live forever in the presence of God in some renewed universe. I believe that with all of my heart. And it's all because of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, none of it matters. If Jesus just died on the cross, Paul says we're still in our sins. The resurrection was the complete and final nail in the coffin of darkness. And so what darkness held captive for three days, light set free forever. On that morning, the curse of sin worldwide, universe-wide, the curse of sin in your life was reversed, and it was canceled. Fear was extinguished with love, and death was forever swallowed up by eternal life. So on this resurrection day, we are faced with a question. Remember the very first question? I hope you've been thinking about that and I hope you don't leave here today without turning that stone over to God and saying, God, I am not capable, I'm not powerful enough to move this stone on my own. I need your grace, I need your love, I need your mercy, I need the perfect sacrifice of your son and the power of the resurrection to remove that stone in my life. Whatever it is, whatever it is. But the next question is, really, what difference does the resurrection make in your life every day? That's the real question, isn't it? It can make a, a beautiful difference for each of us. And so on this resurrection day, that question looms. Who will move the stone? What heavy, immovable stone is blocking your path from the Savior? What do you need to do or let God do in your life, in your heart, to move that stone away so that you can see the empty tomb and walk away from the old life and be reborn again? God moved the stone for these women, and he'll move it for you too. Those are truths of history and truths of Scripture. And without those truths and reality, nothing matters. But because of those truths and realities, nothing matters more. I hope we understand that this morning on this resurrection day. I am thankful that the resurrection is a reality in my life every single day. I'm thankful to celebrate that every day, to celebrate it every Sunday with you. But I'm also thankful that we can celebrate this in mass 
with all the millions of others in the world who claim Christ as Lord and Savior, and they too trust and hope in the resurrection. I'm so thankful for that. And I hope the moment does not pass into Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and forgotten again until next year. I hope it makes an impact on each of us every single day. So I pray this morning that this message, despite the messenger, has spoken to you in the way that only God's Word, His Spirit, can speak. The Spirit knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need to hear, how you need to hear it, how it needs to be packaged, and how it needs to be applied to what you're going through in your life right now. Don't wall that off with a stone of your heart. Roll away that stone so God can enter your heart this morning. We're going to stand, we're going to encourage each other in song, and I pray that being here for you today was a blessing, and it was empowering, and it was encouraging. And I hope to see you again real soon. Charlie, come on. Let's stand together. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer. Lifting me up from the ground Love is the power Where my freedom song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down
<clears throat> Before Brian has our final prayer today, we've had, had a request for a special prayer. Uh, Scott Boyle has a friend whose name is David Cipher. Uh, David Cipher uh, has cancer, and David's wife, um, Susan, called Scott and requested a prayer on uh, David, Dave's behalf. So let's do that right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope we have because of the resurrection. Father, we have a request today for prayer for an individual that has cancer. Uh, Dave Pfeiffer has, uh, has a spot on his lung, so Father, we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will be with that family, give them hope, give them a measure of peace today on this Easter Sunday, and we pray for healing, Father, for Dave Pfeiffer today. We pray for Susan, and we know she's concerned, so we just pray for healing on his behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brian. It's good to be here, to be involved in uh, the lives of our brothers and sisters, to remember that Jesus is our Savior and he's a healer of sickness and our fears. We appreciate the uh, lesson, Dad, of course, as always. Uh, stand with me now as we are dismissed. Our Father, we thank you for the cross, Lord. We thank you for the price that you made, redeeming us by the sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for our fellowship today to be able to see one another and support one another. We ask that you be with those who are suffering sickness, those who are suffering cancer, and those who have diseases and suffering loss we, we pray for those who have suffered the loss of their husbands or wives or friends and family. Be with us and give them your peace and healing. Help us, Father, as we leave this place today and are reminded of your glorious son's sacrifice that we can be here in his presence. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.